صلوا على محمد وآل محمد We're continuing with the celebration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam was born on the same day as Rasulullah. So that's why we celebrate the same times. So when we commemorate, commemorate the same times. So one of the tributes of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam was his father, Imam al-Baqir was known to be deep in knowledge. That Imam al-Sadiq he says, my words are my father's words. And my father's words are the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And Rasulullah connects us to who? Allah azza wa jal. And as they practiced this amazing religion. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, Afdalu zuhd, ikhfa al zuhd. The best, the best way to be, literally. Zuhd is to be indifferent. I gain something, great. I don't gain it, it's great. I'm still okay. My heart does not move. I'm not affected by the loss or the gain. That's zuhd. He says that, to be that indifferent, is the best way is to what? Conceal it. Don't show it. He's saying that's the best. So far so that Imam al-Sadiq salam was entering the bazaar. And he walks in and he's wearing very fine clothes. He's wearing like really up-to-date clothes. Because his time he could do that. There, was no, there wasn't that oppression on him. So a man sees him, and he walks up to Imam al-Sadiq And he says to him, he says, look at the difference now between what? Someone who's indifferent truly on the inside, and someone who's bearing it and wants to show off from the outside. Place yourself in these two categories. You as a person, take a judgment of yourself. Right now at this moment, as we go through this, there's a spectrum. See it, then apply it to yourself. It's your own life. See what your heart tells you. Have a conversation with your own heart. And then be truthful with it. Don't hide the truth from your own self. Imam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam was known to be what? A sadiq the truthful one. The first person you gotta be truthful with is yourself. That's a very difficult conversation sometimes. Trust me. It's not easy to tell yourself the truth. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, the truth is heavy and bitter. It's amazing when you think about that. <laughs> to really look down deep inside your heart and see. Measure yourself. Truly, am I really here? Or am I really here? Do I justify my actions here? And do I lie to myself? That actually leads to self-sabotage? Or do I tell myself the truth that leads to self-development? Because I need help in this area. You're admitting to yourself. So Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam sees this man approaching. And he says to him, I have never seen your forefathers wear this. I've, seen, I've never seen them do that. Why are you doing this? His garb, he had nice, a nice garb. He looks at him. He says, this is for my own dignity. Remember Ikhfa al-Zuhd? Not to show you're, you're normal amongst people. You're not boasting. I'm not this and I'm not that. Your clothing talks. It talks. Your emotions talk. Your behavior talks. 93%, 93% of trust is lost before you open your mouth. 93%. 
Your clothing talks. It conveys messages. Sometimes our clothing doesn't convey the same message as our tongue. Now, he says to him, this is for my own dignity. This is for me amongst the people. And listen to what the Imam does. He grabs the other man's hand and he slips it underneath his garb. This is the epitome of wisdom of the application. It's incredible when you want to relay a message. It's incredible. These are the people we follow. Why? Because of these things. He feels his undergarments. They're rough. They're very rough. Imam Sadiq does what? He puts his hand inside the hand of what? The other man, who was wearing what? Very raggedy clothes. He was wearing very what? Raggedy clothes. Proclaiming that he was what? Poor, different. Look at me, I'm humble. We want that attention. We want that attention in every which way. Look at me, I'm a good person. Sometimes we parade what we want. We want everyone to see it. And now you can parade it at a completely different level. Because we need that attention. We need it. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, when you do something, conceal it. It's the best way to do it. He feels inside his clothes. His undergarments were very soft and silky. See the difference? It's incredible. One is truly for Allah, Azza wa Jal. And one is what? For the eyes of everyone else. Because I need that attention. I need it. I need people to tell me, look, you look good. They need to validate who I am. Hassanin said something beautiful last week. He says, you like me, I like me. I used it, by the way, multiple times. That's really incredible. Now, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, what is he telling us? Let's be normal amongst everyone. But you are a flag. You are a walking, talking billboard. You are. What you wear matters. What you say matters. How you say it matters. Everything about you matters. Can we represent at that level? Can we? I'm going to give you three things really quickly about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. As Imam, Sajjad, Imam Sadiq salam, states that his words are his father's words. And his, his father's words are the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let's take a look just really quickly at the akhlaq of the Prophet. And can we do this? The Prophet was known to always have a smile on his face. He was always known to have that. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, even if it gets this bad, have a smile on your face. He says, wear your pain in your heart and wear your smile on your face. Completely different, my God. Would you really think about that? How many of you have felt pain? I'm sure everyone has felt it. How hard is it to put that smile on your face when you feel that pain? How difficult is it? The last time I checked, it takes 17 muscles in your face to smile. It takes 43 to frown. You want to get older? Really quick, you want those wrinkles? There you go. But what happens when you do that? There's something in the other person that happens when you smile on someone's face. Here's what happens. But when you smile, is your heart truly smiling? Even with the pain, that's a higher degree. That no matter what you feel on the inside, 
You're so connected to the outside world. It's incredible. When you trigger a smile on your face, here's what happens in the other person's brain. There's something that we have in our brains. Every person's got this. This is why you smile when you see a little baby smile. There's something in your brain called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons actually mirror the other person's expressions. They actually trigger automatically. And there's studies that have shown now that when you smile, when you smile, it actually induces certain neurotransmitters to be released and what? Hormones to be released. You actually can put yourself in a better mood just by what? Smiling. But the society we live in now, God help you if you just what? Cut off someone. Just, just People are just angry. We're so angry. Having anger is like having a sunburn. What happens when somebody touches a person who has a sunburn? It's like, right away, reaction. That's anger. You touch that person, bam, just blow. There's no restraint. It just happens. Are you in that state? Or in another state? Now, Rasulullah was also known to send his greetings first. When he would be walking around, he would send his greetings first when he would see someone. How many of us, when we see someone we know, like, you look at them, did they see me, not see me? It's okay, they didn't see me, I'll just go. We do that. We don't go out of our way just to make sure that what? We say, Salaamu Alaikum. Guess what? If you say, Salaamu Alaikum first, you're earning what? You guys know the math, I'm not going to say anything. Okay, 69, you're earning 70, 71. If it comes from your heart, who knows? Who knows what Allah is going to give you? Yes. What is it? Jannah. Jannah. Beautiful. Inshallah, we all get there. Number three. Rasulullah was also known to shake hands first. Look at the akhlaq of Rasulullah. Sometimes we walk in, we just walk around, we don't even care. And I'm talking to myself first. Sometimes we forget. But look at the love from Rasulullah This is how we need to be. Imam al-Sadiq was one of the representatives of Rasulullah. If you look at them, one by one by one, they were a map to the next person. Literally. That's how they were. Can we be their map? Can we? Can we do that in this time and age where it's so difficult now? Everyone's got trouble. Everyone. But I, somebody sent me this and I'll finish with this this morning. I received this and it was a alim, he was speaking. And he said, is there anybody, he, was, he asked this alim, and he says, is there anybody murtah fi I don't know, has anybody seen it? You seen it? And he says, does anybody, is anybody like really have a sanctuary where everybody's okay, that person's okay? And the person says, yes, there is. He's like, who's the person? They tell him who the person is. He goes over there and he says, okay, you're in a good state. Are you murtah? He's like, yes, my name is Murtah. He goes, but I have all the problems in the world. So everyone's going to have their problems. Trust me. It's just the way we look at them. Disconnect as much as you can from the temptations of this world. And be a zahid. Can you get to that stage? Can your garments from the inside truly be what? Harsh, where you don't need anybody to tell you who you are. 
Can, can you be that at that stage? Can we be like that? That's what we should strive for. That's what we should get to. And we have the best exemplars to do that. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 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 Sallallahu alayhi wa
that was Imam Ali, for example, allowed to do what he was going to do in Muawiyah, didn't trouble him. Imam Hassan, the same thing. Imam Hussein, the same thing. Then we would have had the most massive institution of academia on earth. And many of the secrets that we haven't understood today would have been uncovered, and our lives would have been at a better level. But nonetheless, let's suffice it to say that the Quran, which is a complete book, has given us the foundation of knowledge. And now all we needed actually for our Imams was to interpolate, extrapolate, and express it and give more light to the message of God, which is unfortunately sometimes we're left to have to uh, figure it out ourselves through the principles of Ijtihad. But let's know that 255 years after the Hijrah that Allah managed and kept us reflective of the Prophet through the Imams. Surah Al-Kahf, very important. So in this verse, the seventh verse that I started, you find that the Quran is a book of morals, is telling us that you have been created to be tested on earth. Now, of course, that's not the reason we were created. The reason we were created is because God is merciful. Allah created all his creations in the universes simply because he's merciful. He just wants to share from his infinite treasury. But the modus operandi, meaning that once we come into existence, and should God give me the power to select good from evil, meaning give me limited free will, then it's a requirement that we should be tested. There's no other way. If you and I are ever given free will, then we must be tested. If we lack free will, there's no test. But if we have free will, we must be tested. And what's the test all about? It's predicated on the principles of intellect. Now, intellect, aql, is very deep, meaning this cognitive recognition of the presence of the Almighty. When Allah says, نَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Indeed, we are closer to you than your jugular vein. Here you will notice even those who reject God, like atheists, will tell you that there is some supreme being. Okay, and if, 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 you, if they lose control of their antithetical positions with regards to God, you will see that they will utter things that they, it will be evidence against them that they actually do believe God is there. Those who become atheists typically reject God, not because they want to reject God. They've been confused by those who pretend to believe in God, or those who are within the paradigm of religion. As Imam Ali says, atheism is the result of the misdeeds of the believers. So when you and I as believers, if we misrepresent our religion, we become extremists, or we take religion out of boundaries, then atheism has credibility, because now it sees religion as an extreme ideology, and you find the atheist considers themselves moderate. But when believers are moderate, then atheism will fade away, because the natural result of our existence is to know that there's a superior being. Even Dan Barker, when he debated me, he said, when I see your God, he looked at me, he you know, said, Hassan, when I see your God on Judgment Day, I am gonna tell him you are wrong. So I looked at him and I said, oh, Dan, you do believe you will see him. That's good, that's good, because this debate is about whether he exists or not. So you seem to be pretty confident. Because it's true. Honestly, for you and I to exist without an infinite being, is ludicrous. It's absolutely absurd. For anyone to postulate anything further than that has not understood the realities of life. And I don't want to go into that. Let me jump into Surah Al-Kaf, the 18th chapter. Beautiful. God says, I will test you. So this verse number 7 sets the premise. Surely we have made whatever is on the earth an embellishment so that we may try them as to which of them is best in deeds, in best in works. Ahsanu uh, Amala. So Tulkaf has four stories, four main stories. It's very important for all of us. When there are 114 chapters. When someone says Surah Al Mulk, Surah Al Waqa, you know, Surah Yusuf, Surah Maryam, what does it entail? You should have a quick mental image. I know what this story is about, what it references, what sort of verses are in it. What, of, what sort of do's and don'ts are not in there, so that we have a mental image of the Qur'an. So as a synopsis today, within 10-15 minutes, I'm going to present something, I want you to pay attention. There are four trials in this surah, four. The first trial Allah talks about are the youth of the cave, known as Ashab al-Kahf. And Allah says, أَمْ حَسِبْتَ أَنَّ أَصْحَابَ الْكَهْفِ وَالرَّقِيمِ كَانُوا مِنْ آيَاتِنَا عَجَبًا 
So there are four stories. If you can, let me just plug this in, and I'll see. You know, you kind of get a visual of where I'm going with this. Okay. Hopefully, it'll show up here. Just say, make it work, please. All right, four. Very important for you and I to have this because Surah Al Kaf. By the way, the Messenger, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, stated that if you read Surah Al Kaf, especially on a daily basis, or even once a week, once a month. The Prophet stated there is a beam of light that comes out of your heart to the Kaaba, to the furthest Kaaba, and in between that light are angels who represent you, you know, glorifying and asking for your forgiveness. Meaning, you now have representation. So there are four stories in Surah Al-Kaf. The first one is the people of the cave, Ashab Al-Kaf. Quick synopsis. We find there were a group of youth in Byzantium, in Rome, and what you find is that the king, his name was Trajan. Trajan declared himself a god. He said, I am a god. But at that time, the Muslims were declaring, La ilaha illallah, Isa Rasulullah. There is no god but one, and Jesus is the prophet of God. That, those were the Muslims of that time. As you know, preceding to that word, La ilaha illallah, Musa Rasulullah. There is no god but one, and Musa is our prophet. At that time, the Muslims used to say, La ilaha illallah, Isa Rasulullah. The king said to them, no. You're all going to worship me. My idols will become your idols. And every time you enter my city and you live in my city, you must worship me as God. So they said, no. This youth group said, no, we're not going to follow that. And therefore, they were being threatened to be crucified. So the king said, I will crucify you. Because at that time, crucifixion was the common means of punishment. In fact, if you entered Rome, as you're entering the, the, the cities of, owned by the Roman Empire, you would see hundreds and thousands of people on the crucifix, alive, being punished. Some would stay for a week, some would stay for a few days, and they would die on the cross. Some were punished only for a short period of time and taken off the cross, and some would die on the cross. And the average lifespan in Rome at that time was about 36 years of age. So around 36, 38, you died. Today, 75, 70, almost double the age. Then people used to die much earlier. The youth of the cave said, no, we believe in one God. So the first trial, the people of the cave, was the trial of Iman, faith. Okay? So Allah talks about this. Look at these. I'm hasidta. Have you taken account of an ashab al-kahfi wa raqim The youth of the cave and the inscription. Kanu min ayatina ajaba. It's a great thing. Meaning it's, it's amazing. Ajaba, ajib. If awal fitya tu ila al-kahfi. When the youth of the cave say, alu. Our Lord, give us from your infinite treasury and make our affairs right. So I advise us all, if there is one qunut you and I should read when we pray to God, this. Ask for God to give us from his infinite treasury, and make our affairs right. Allah, I don't know. I don't know what decision to make. My wisdom is limited. My knowledge is limited. My Lord, you're the wisest. You direct me where you want me to go and let me be of your service. So if you want me to be whatever you want me to be, then make me and take me there. The youth did that. They didn't dictate to Allah. They said, we don't know. This king is very powerful and he can crucify us and kill us, but we don't care. We have children. We have our spouses. We don't care. We are not giving up our faith. Excellent example, Imam Hussain alayhi salam in Karbala. Same situation, but unfortunately the Imam was massacred. Allah said, look what I did for them. Because they asked me to make their affairs right, I took them and put them to sleep in the cave, and they slept for 300 plus years. Unimaginable if you and I were to ever pray to God, that you and I would ever dare to ask God to put us to sleep for centuries, so that we could witness what happens to this tyrant who claims to be a God, so that he can turn to dust and I can witness it. So God says, okay, I'll let you see it. 300 years later, Trajan was in the grave, dust, and God says, did you see this? He claimed to be a God. Look at him now. First, so the first was the Surah so Al-Kaf, was people of the cave. The principle behind it is, is the trial of faith, Iman. The second story is about the owner of the two gardens. As you know, God gave this person a wonderful garden. But because he became self-sufficient, he thought there's no need for God anymore. Humans are like that, unfortunately. When we become self-sufficient, we become arrogant. We think our money is our protector, our power. You become a leader. So you have a president today who thinks all his power is in the constituent voters, and he thinks they're the ones who are going to make him. But he's, he's walking on thin ice. 
is actually fantasizing because the reality is going to dawn on him very soon, the way Fir'aun got the reality when he was drowning. So Allah is saying, look at this person. He was thinking he doesn't need me. He became arrogant. And what did I do to him? I destroyed his two gardens. It was rich with food, but I destroyed it overnight. He woke up and it was all gone. But it was too late for him to seek forgiveness because his arrogance got the best of him, right? Third story, Musa and Khidr. So the second story is the trial of wealth. Al-Hakum al-Takathur. Abundance diverts you. Quran constantly says that they think their wealth is sufficient. Abu Lahab was like that, right? Abu Lahab, you know, Abu Lahab means father of fire. He was so rich when the Prophet came, his own uncle told him, accept God. He said, my wealth, I don't, I'm going to lose my wealth. And he refused and he died. Nothing. Actually, his body was on the mountain and it was a treacherous death that Abu Lahab faced. Abu Jahl, same thing. Abu Sufyan, they all thought their money. Muawiyah, Umar ibn As. Umar ibn As is the one who made Muawiyah powerful. Umar ibn As had over a thousand red camels. You know what a red camel is like today? Like a Bentley. One red camel is like a Bentley. Okay, it's like three, four hundred thousand dollars. A red camel is when you're extremely rich. He had over a thousand of them. Muawiyah kept feeding him. Make me rich, make me powerful. Then in the end, when Muawiyah established himself, he took everything from Umar. Umar bin says he's dying. He says, the day I die, Muawiyah is going to take everything I have. And subhanAllah, exactly what happened. Not a single tyrant on earth has ever existed on this earth with happiness. So it's a trial of money. The th third one is about Musa and Khidr. Allah, as you know, Musa is Ul Azam prophet, a great prophet. And he's the one who, who got revelations. As you know, he got the Torah, the Torah, and he freed the children of Israel from the grip of um, the Pharaoh. And he split the sea, and he, he performed miraculous Nine, nine signs, Allah says, Fi tis'i ayat, and I gave him nine miracles, nine. And Musa functioned magnificently. But God said to Musa, now there is somebody wiser than you. Go learn from him. He was also a messenger of God. We call him Khidr. Khidr meets him at the banks, and he wants to go with Musa. I mean, Musa wants to go with Khidr. But Khidr says, I will let you come with me, but on one condition that you won't question me. Because what you're going to see, you won't be able to bear it. So Musa replies, Satajidun insha'Allah min as God giving, I mean God willing, I will be patient. He doesn't promise him. He said, I will be patient. So Musa and Khidr travel, and as you know, the first thing Khidr does is he sinks a boat. A, a, a nice boat, but he sinks, puts a hole and sinks it. So Musa looks at him and says, what did you just do? It was a perfectly working boat. Why did you sink it? He said, Lan amaniya sabra. didn't I tell you, you won't be able to be patient. So Musa is silent. And then the next thing is, you know, there was a young child who Khidr removes from this world. He said, what did you do? This is terrible. He said, Lan amaniya sabra. didn't I tell you? The third thing that Khidr does is there was a wall that was leaning and the people of that city were harsh, they were rude. So when Musa and Khidr arrived, they were very un unwelcoming. But nonetheless, Khidr builds this, you know, takes the wall and straightens it out. So Musa says to Khidr that, you know, we could charge for this if we did this. And Khidr says to him, didn't I He says, now we will separate. I've shown you three signs. None could you bear, so we will separate. So he says, let me give you the ta'wil. Let me explain this to you. The first one, he says, I did it. The second one, he says, uh, God did it. The third one, he says, we did it. It's very interesting how Khidr approaches this, because these are the commands of God. Now, I don't want to go deep into analyzing this, but here's the point. God is telling me that your reaction in life is going to be subject to the level of your knowledge. The greater the depth you have, the more you'll understand the intricacies of life. The less of the knowledge you have, the more you will be questioning the integrity of things. So what Musa did was not a mistake. He didn't make a single mistake. In fact, Musa doesn't even ask for forgiveness from Khidr. In fact, he says to Khidr, don't taunt me. I did what I think is best. 
Musa never asks for forgiveness from Khidr. Understand that. And Musa does not make a single mistake. What Musa is saying to us is my knowledge base is this much, and when I do see this based on my knowledge, it is incumbent upon me to question it based on my level of knowledge. But if I have greater knowledge, then my question will be separate. So Musa performed his duties perfectly. And Khidr is showing him that there's always somebody smarter with a deeper understanding of ta'weel. And Allah says, لا يعلم تعويلا إلا الله والراسخون في العلم يقولون آمنا No one knows the interpretation and the inner depth of the words of God and, and though, except Allah and those deeply rooted in knowledge say we believe because they are also given that knowledge. So Musa did receive that knowledge but the third trial is the trial of knowledge. Our acquisition of knowledge. The fourth story is with reference to a very powerful person known as Zulkarnain. Zulkarnain is not, some people say it was Alexander the Great. It was not. We don't know that. Please don't associate Alexander the Great with Zulkarnain. Zulkar just because Zulkarnain went to very distant land, and Quran says the sun was setting in muddy waters, implying it went to the furthest east zone. But it is not, so, you know, it is not, we don't know. So Alexander the Great was very, very capricious, very hungry for power. Uh, he, he committed many, many things that Islam would forbid historically. And what is interesting is Alexander the Great actually had a historian who stood, he used to take with him. In every battle, he would take a historian or a group of them and he would tell them, write about me, because he wanted to be a great man. So we have a lot of history in Alexander. But Zulkarnain is a different person. This was a powerful agent of God. And he goes to the furthest regions and there were a people having difficulty due to some kind of an incursion that was coming from beings that were odd, known as Ajuj and Majuj. And they were of voracious quality, meaning they were, they were like machines that would eat you. And they were in trouble. And so Karnain pushes them back, Quran says, builds a wall. Some people say, oh, this is the Great Wall of China. Let's not make it. You know, we try to associate wall, Great Wall of China. No. These associations are a bit risky. Just keep it simple. He pushes them back, he seals them with his power. So the third trial is the trial of power. Okay, force. When you have power, when you can rule, when you are like Suleiman. Four trials, Quran talks about. So you want to go on the same? What was saying? It's tired. The fourth one. Okay. <laughs> okay, fourth power. So this, these four. And inshallah, I want us to understand, if we and I can recite Surah Al-Kaf, uh, it would be awesome. And um, inshallah, hopefully, we have um, some guests. Going to the ta'wil, you didn't finish the ta'wil of the three. Oh, the three, you mean the sinking? Yes. Yeah. So the first one was that there was a, uh, a tyrant who was going to come and um, occupy these people's properties and he was going to take all the good properties. So Khidr damaged one so that the king, who was a tyrant, will not take that, so that the good people will still be able to fix that boat so they can use it. The second one, it's very complicated. It's a very deep philosophical reality is that this child was going to be a tyrant and God replaces the good parents with another child. The third one was the fact that there were two orphans whose wealth, their father was a very pious man and he hid the wealth for these two orphans and the, the wall was the marker. If the wall fell, there'd be no more marker. So Khidr rebuilds it to ensure that those children, when they do reach maturity, that they will be able to take the wealth that is hidden under that wall. That's the ta'wil. Okay? The moral of the story is that the agents of God are constantly doing things for us, though you and I, you and I may not see it. So people say, what is Imam Mahdi doing for me today? You and I don't know. There are thousands of good things he's doing that you and I may consider not done, but actually he has prepared them. And God doesn't have to tell us about it. Just like every breath you and I take is a blessing of God. When children ask me, I say to them, pray, thank God. I say, for what? I said, do you realize that if you have one insect that comes into your throat and lodges into your lung, you'll be going horizontal. You may die. Okay, one little virus. Stop playing with each other's hands. I know you like each other, but you know... A little bit, okay. Uh, so what happens then is that you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly doing good things for us. Constantly. When you get in the car and you drive and you arrive safely, 
you, we, we don't appreciate what Allah has done. You know, the other day I was traveling and um, my flight was delayed. Why? Because there was snow that was, you know, I was traveling to New York. It was a funeral and I was traveling to New York for the funeral and I had to time myself. So I'm at the airport, six o'clock in the morning, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get there. There was a storm in Chicago and there was a storm here. But the flight that was coming from Chicago was delayed to come to Dearborn, Detroit, and therefore my flight was delayed to New York. I got delayed three hours, three, three and a half hours. And you're waiting, and you're looking at the time, you're waiting, is the plane here? And you're starting to question everything, like, oh my God, what's going on? And then you realize, I have probably put 200,000 miles of flight time, and it's like on time. The plane comes in, you get in, you leave. We don't realize the blessings of Allah, that when that plane takes off on time, and it lands, and the pilot says, in 13 minutes, we're going to land, and we do land, you think that's all just haphazard chance? It's the blessings of Allah. And Allah says, I'm the one who brings that. But every once in a while, I let you taste lack thereof for you to appreciate what I've given you. And I think loss is the greatest lesson in life. We think gain is something we should always be having from Allah. No. That's why Allah says, We will test you with fear. Why? Loss. Loss of your wealth. Well, enforce yourselves. What thamarat, your fruits. <laughs> Give good news to the patient ones. They're the ones who, when they endure this patient, this difficulty, they say, Inna lillah wa inna Indeed, we are from Allah, and indeed we return to Him. That's the real value. My Hajj Usam mentioned a beautiful term, zuhud. Zuhud means you have no connection with anything. Your value is only with God. Allah uses this word Zahideen when Yusuf was sold and Allah says he was sold for a meager price and Allah uses the word Zahideen Zahid meaning it wasn't given right value what happens is a Zahid is a, is a person who's got power, who's got wealth, who's got all of these but they're not drunk with it they use it as a tool to get closer to God I mentioned this story, I'll mention it again and we'll end if anybody has a quick comment question we'll end there was a man who was a Zahid, very, very pious person, but very rich. Now many of us, as Haji Bissam mentioned beautifully, people ask Imam Jafar Sadiq, why are you wearing such nice garb? You know, your grandfather, Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib, was so humble that even that his shoes were so torn that there was no more room to mend it. So we think that the Imams, and if you want to wear the path of God, you have to walk on, you know, barefoot and ride donkeys maybe today, you know. Like, of course, these days donkeys are more expensive than cars, but you get my point. Oh, how dare you have a nice dress? Astaghfirullah. Don't you love God? We have this analogy that when you love God, you have to be so abstemious in life that you know you have to barely be able to afford something because that's the way of God. Whoever said that? You could be a billionaire. You could be the richest person on earth and be the finest agent of God. Suleiman was like that. He was the richest. To have a palace made of a floor of glass, then, today, maybe technology. Then, the priest enters, she thinks the floor is wet and she raises her dress. She thinks it's going, she, her foot is going to get wet. And Suleiman looks at her and says, no, don't worry, this is glass. Like, wow, who are you? What are you? To be able to bring a throne with the flash of an eye, to have surveillance. You're talking about drones that think, that believe in God. Find me a drone today that comes and says, he's doing shirk. Which drone tells us that? So the Imam's drone did that. So he was way ahead. A Zahid is a person who's not connected. Everything, money, power, knowledge, everything is for Allah. Faith, all for Allah. Everything is for Allah. My life, my death, my sacrifice, my prayers, everything. So the story goes and quickly and I'll end. A man heard that this was a Zahid living in this city, and he said, oh, let me go visit him. So I heard this guy's a big Zahid. Zahid meaning he's very um, godly. When he comes to him, and he enters his house, it's a palace, he enters a palatial place, he sees servants everywhere, and he's stunned. He's walking around, of course, this guy liked, always loved to have a tasbih. You know, some people just love a tasbih in their hand. Simple, rosary. He's holding a rosary. And he goes and visits this man. So with the rosary, he's going in, he's looking, so, hmm, this man is a man of God, huh? I doubt it. 
I mean, there's too much wealth here. Can't be with God. So what happens is that he sits around thinking. The Zahid already has that sixth sense. You know, God gives them knowledge of things that the average cannot see. The Zahid recognizes them. So in the busyness, he's sitting wondering, like, where did this guy get all this wealth? And, you know, he starts to doubt him. And the moral of the story with Zahid is that the man, the Zahid, says to this man who's residing, come with me. Because a, a servant comes and whispers into his ears, I need to do something. So this man gets up, leaves, and walks away. And he says to this visitor, come with me, let's go. He said, okay. So while they're walking on the street, that man who came to visit says, can I go back to your, to your, to your house? He said, why? He said, I left my tasbih. He said, it's okay, just leave it. We're going to do something very important for God. He said, no, 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 no. I can't leave without my tasbih. I need my tasbih. So the Zahid says, you are doubting about connection with God when you can't let go of a tasbih to go to Allah's work. I left my whole palace and I left everything behind to go to Allah's work. I don't understand you, your confusion. Meaning the Zahid is saying, I gave up all that wealth to go and do Allah's work and I may get killed and I don't care. But you can't let go of your tasbih. So don't be fooled by people who think that they're so connected to God because they're living a meager life. When actually zuhud means that you could be running a billion dollar empire, but in a heartbeat you give it up because you're not connected with it. It's only a tool to do God's work. I hope that makes sense. Okay? So, shall I, let's take lesson. So, who can, who can, without looking at this, who can, who can reiterate this? Yeah? Yes, yeah, good. Who can, re who, who, who can tell me? Um, what's your name, brother? Taha. Taha, yes. How can I forget Taha? So like all what are the four? Yeah, what are the four trials? What's the first trial? The trial so is about what? It's about people, so there is Yeah, the trial of what? Just give me the name. The trial of the people of the cave. Okay, and uh, people of the cave was a trial about what? About, about their? Their faith. Excellent. First one is their faith. Second one, brother. Uh, <clears throat> Second trial. Trial of wealth. Excellent. Second was trial of wealth. Third. Just third. <coughs> yes. Trial of knowledge. The third one was the trial of knowledge with Khidr and Musa. As you notice, that, that was the third. And the fourth one, who said power? Yeah. Sister Zainab? Power of? I mean, the trial of what? Somebody say it back there, I heard. Yeah, yeah. So the fourth one is the trial of power. So Allah will give us, will test us on faith. He will test us in wealth. Okay? He will test us with knowledge and he will test us with power. Four powers Allah will test us. And in the same surah, Allah describes how to win them. Next time we'll talk about that, inshallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. We're out of time. Any question, comments? Please, indulge. And you know what's interesting, when I leave, people say, oh brother, I have a question to ask you. So why didn't you ask in the audience? I think I had a discussion with somebody had come and asked me a question. Just ask. You know, when you ask a question, I. I'm pretty sure many of us are thinking in that direction, but it needed somebody to ask us. Sister Mari. The difference between feel well and we actually, our path is chosen for us. Okay. Is there such a thing as totality of free will? Is there totality of predestination? It's in between. The Imam, our Prophet and Imams have described that our free will is limited. It's not total and it's not completely uh, incapacitated. So a person comes and asks our sixth imam, he says, describe that. He said, lift any foot out of your two feet. So one, the person lifts one foot. Okay, he says, now while holding this foot up, lift the other without falling. And the person says, I cannot. So the imam says, the first one is your free will, the second one was predestination. Mm -hmm. So we have limited free will. There is nobody on earth in the universe who has total free will except God. Now you and I cannot take our birthdays back, could we? Can you imagine if we change our birthday? I take it back, take it forward, take it back, take it forward. Change our gender, change the structure of Earth. You know, I don't like Earth being a sphere. I like it flat. And some people, you know, believe the Earth is flat. Uh, you know, I don't like this. I don't, you and I cannot. There are certain things. There's nothing you and I can do about it. Nothing. Our parents, our siblings, we can't do anything about it. That's what we call predestined. The laws of the universe are predestined. Our birth is predestined. Our humanity is predestined. We cannot go underwater without an apparatus. You know, and, and, and just develop gills, for example. So that's the predestination. And the limited free will is within that paradigm. So if you really want to understand it, draw a big circle, call it predestination. 
and inside draw a small circle and call it free will. So free will is controlled by predestination. Okay. Like a teacher who gives an exam, you're a teacher, when you give an exam to a student, you have predestined the location, the time, the structure, the data. All of that is predestined. The, child, the student has no say in it. But within each question, there's free will. And you're controlling that, aren't you? The entire exam has free will, but it has limited. I mean, the entire exam is predestined by you. The student has no free will in it. The location, the timing, the period. But within the question, the student has freedom to answer. And what are you testing? You're only testing the power of free will. So God on Judgment Day will not ask us if we have eyes. Why do we have two eyes, not three eyes? Why are we humans? No, none of that. God is going to ask us, since you had the capacity to be moral, did you make good moral choices or did you make bad moral choices? That is where the real trial on Judgment Day comes. That's all it's about. Nothing else. Being black, being white, being tall, being short, being wide, being narrow, it's irrelevant. Those are all blessings of God. Skin color, economics, all blessings of God. Gender, everything. Allah says, You know, um, Oh mankind, we made you into male and female, nations and tribes, so you know each other. It's a blessing, spice to life. God says the most honorable to God is the one who is God conscious, the one who promotes good and forbids evil. Otherwise, there's no such thing. I hope that makes sense. Yes, sister. Is there a death predestined? So our death is predestined by God, but we can change it. It's the principle of bada. Meaning, the prophets say, if you want to prolong your life, gain knowledge and distribute it. Even if the angel of death was predestined to come and take your soul, God postpones it. But you and I must interact in it. So God really knows that we will interact, but it's a, on Judgment Day, God will show us. This was your destiny. You were going to die this day. But because you indulged by your own goodness, and you did something good, I postponed it. Although I knew you would postpone it, that, that I will postpone it, but I'm letting you know that it is my decree to be this day. But I've allowed you to interfere in my decree. And Allah says, Inna Allah la yughayru ma biqawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusim. God doesn't change the affairs of a community until he changes them themselves first. So God is telling you and me, indulge in it. You know, ya yuhun nasu, you know, for example, at Tukhur, right? Wal tandur nafsun ma qaddamat li ghad. Be careful of what you send tomorrow. You and I, you know, our blessed Imam, uh, Prophet has said that when you do a deed, Right? Understand its consequence, otherwise don't do it, because you, you and I are sending something forward. So yes, we can change our death dates. The other way to change a death date is to give charity. When you give charity, Allah prolongs your life. It's very important. Speaking of charity, um, help us with the academy, please. Your support is very important. As you know, we're launching ICRA. ICRA is the Institute for Quranic Research and Application. It's going to be a full force program that's going to be, inshallah, global, international. We're going to have our radio station opening up next week. We're going to be trying our podcasts. We're going to be doing Friday night programs. We didn't launch the official ICRA program yet because we're setting up the structure. But it's a non-profit um, venture, and we need your support. We're trying to raise a few hundred thousand dollars because there are about 20 scholars around the world that we want to hire to be our uh, employees. So they will be connected with our youth around the world in teaching to recite Quran, to do tajweed, discussions, etc., write-ups, articles, the whole nine yard. And it costs money to do that. Let's bequeath it. Let's put money in it and say, in the name of our loved ones who have died, let's put this, because there is nothing to me. I pray to Allah every single day. If there is one thing I must accomplish that I have not accomplished to my satisfaction is to create the most powerful Quranic movement, institution, because I'm afraid that the Prophet will say, Ya Rabbi, inna qawmi takhadu hadha Quran mahjura. My Lord, my community ignored it. We, Allah has blessed us with these beautiful facilities. Shame on us if we don't make it central for the Quran. If we need help, it's a lot of work. It's a tremendous amount. I go home at three, four in the morning every single day, because planning, strategizing is just a monumental task. But I love it, and I feel greatly honored to have this opportunity to do that. So please, help.
help us. Many a times people come and say, brother, you built the school, what can we do to help? Here, help us. Give us a loan. You know, we're we are, we are heavy, we're struggling right now. We have to build a swimming pool for $500,000. The British Swim School gave us 250. We still have to dish out a quarter million dollars from our own pocket. It's tough. Sometimes we barely make our payrolls because it's tough. Not because we're not running the operation, but we're just growing too fast. Help us, please, whatever you can. It's nonprofit. A brother gave us, I'll give you an example. A brother gave us $100,000 four years ago. He sold a house, he said, I have 100,000 sitting, here it is. I said, fine. So we took the 100,000, we wrote him an article that whatever amount, so it was like 20% it was twenty percent interest, interest is hard, but we just put it on paper. And then what he did was he gave us the 20% back. That's legal, completely legal. CPA is a completely legal system. What he did was, after four years, he wrote off almost $80,000 in interest, you know, from his margins. So he had a windfall business this year. He needed to do a write-off. We issued him an $80,000 receipt. Technically, he gave us the 100. He got all the 100 back. We already gave him the 100,000 back. He was paid back. But the beauty was, not only did he help us, we helped him. So now, he had to pay less taxes. So why don't we think that way, and let's make these institutions grow, because our next generations, there's a tremendous amount of work that's needed. Let's be charitable. Let's leave legacies behind. You know, and Allah said, Tawasal bil haq, Tawasal bil sab. You know what Tawasal is? The root word is wasaya. Wasaya, wasaya is wasiya. When you leave a, behind a will. Tawasal. Leave a legacy, Allah says. Bil haq, with truth. And legacy with patience. Leave it. Carve it. So this Tawab jari. We'll be in the grave. Nobody will talk about us. I'm telling you, me. People say to me, you have a website? I say, for what? Why don't the people to hear it? Say, Inshallah, someday. But the point is, my great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, won't even know my first name. So why am I trying to carve my name anywhere? What's, by the way, we also have a conference coming up next week, on th uh, starting Thursday. We'll have a Kumail here at night. So there will be a discussion. There will be a much larger audience. We'll be having the same program next Thursday. But it's a three-day conference. And the reason was that there's this large group of families that come from Syria, from all around the world, to our camp every summer. And they love it. They feel this is their, their spiritual recharging. But they say, in between that, we need another dose. So they said, you have this great facility. Why don't we do a conference? We'll all come from around the country, and we'll do a three-day conference. They'll be staying at the Henry, and we'll be doing dialogues, discussions. It's also a very social event. It's a, it's a great meet and greet kind of event. And Dearborn. Dearborn has the largest Muslim population in a non-Muslim country in the world. We have the most concentrated Muslim population in the world. And if they won't leave their little cocoons once in a while, how about we bring the world to them? And of course people do. But let's invite others and let's have something, you know, as much as we can to promote um, spirituality. Thursday night, thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate this, especially this young generation. You know, sitting outside, some of you on the computers, on the phone, and I said, what are you doing? So, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm watching a video on a cat. So why? Thursday night. Oh, I do do I read it. I said, no. Thursday is special. This is the night when the spirits come. This is the night when God is made. The day of Friday has begun. You know, when the sun sets, Friday begins. And Allah says, Friday is the most spiritual day. Thank you, Sister Zainab, for being, you know, she's calling everybody. Sister Zainab also, thank you for bringing a sister with you. Bring your friends over. Let's have a dialogue. We'll eat together, socialize. Let's build this. This is something God on Judgment Day will ask. I gave you millions of dollars worth of institutions. Did you promote me? Did you encourage the kids? Look at the father here sitting, right? Maudis, right? Beautiful. When, little, when children sit with their mother and their father, you know how beautiful that is? You will not understand that until you grow older. You disconnect from this. You know what, you, you know what people do? They hang out in bars and clubs. And they go to malls because they're bored. This is where you plug in. This is where the real stuff is. This is where you take yourself to God. This is where you prevent yourself from damnation and going astray. So please, encourage each other to come. Night out Fortnite? Night, what was it? Stop playing Fortnite? Yeah, stop playing, inshallah. Okay, thank you very much. Allah bless you. Thank you for joining us, inshallah. Yeah, uh, I'd like to also add maybe additional programs on Thursday night, maybe a swim night, you know. Those of you who want to go swimming, come after dua. Uh, Haj Mahmoud is an expert in ping pong. We're creating a whole ping pong room there. There'll be three ping pong tables. The pros are going to come and play. 
We want a ping pong team. So on Thursday night after this, we engage in ping pong, we engage in swimming. You know, the gymnasium is available, maybe you engage in a little basketball, the same way you can run that. I know Sam says, come on, enough, I'm tired, but okay, no, look at Hajj Bissam to the south, so we'll do it too, yes, inshallah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad.